Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Good evening. My name is Julie McCrossan, and it's my enormous pleasure to welcome you to this special webinar, COVID-19 Vaccination, What Do You Need to Know? And it's hosted by leaders of the Jewish community coming together, and we thank them for their, their work over the last week to make this happen. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we're all on Aboriginal land and to pay our respects to elders past and present. For various reasons, I'm coming to you tonight from the land of the Ghana people in Adelaide. And we have among our panel members and special audience guests, uh, people from several different parts of Australia. Quick housekeeping before we begin, we're really here to answer your questions and we welcome them right from now. You put your questions in the Q&A. You can see down the bottom right-hand corner there of your screen, if you click on that, you can write your questions and we can't see or hear you. So that's the only way for you to bring your questions in. Please don't use chat, come in through Q&A. And we have a question moderator, you'll meet him shortly. Richard Glass will be monitoring them. He's already received some and I'll be coming to him throughout the evening uh, to bring your questions to our panel. We will answer as many as possible. They're welcome as anonymous questions. And in fact, we won't name anybody this evening, all questions will effectively be anonymous and we'll do our best to answer as many as possible. And we'll be finishing up at 9 p.m. Uh, Australian Eastern Standard Time. This is being recorded and we'll uh, give you a bit more information later about where you'll be able to see uh, parts of this evening's presentation. So let's begin and it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome Richard Glass. Thanks, Julie, much appreciated. I would also first like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I'm located this evening, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to thank everyone attending tonight for coming along to this important discussion. It's one of a number of initiatives of the leadership of the Jewish community. When it was evident that uh, the virus was wreaking havoc across Europe and it was feared New South Wales could be similarly affected, our community leaders created a forum comprising the leaders of the Executive Council of Australian Jewry, the Jewish Communal Appeal, CSG, Wobble Jewish Hospital, and the New South Wales Jewish Board of Deputies, whose president, Leslie Berger, is also the chairperson of that forum. Through the work of that forum and many other community institutions, our community has worked to provide various means of support, be that financial, social, physical, or emotional. And equally important is the provision of information. And that's the purpose of tonight's webinar. Earlier this year, with the Alpha strain seemingly under control and a vaccine on the horizon, it was hoped that the worst was behind us. However, the arrival of the Delta strain at a time when Australia's vaccination levels were low, not only in absolute terms, but relative to most other Western countries, the stakes were really raised. Frankly, we see the only way we'll get back to anything even remotely approaching a normal life, whether that be our social lives, our work lives, uh, our spiritual lives, or indeed our mental health, is for an extremely high level of vaccination in the community. So this evening, you'll hear from a diverse panel, be able to ask questions and hopefully come to your own conclusion as to whether the most important thing for us is to be vaccinated and that for the great majority of people, it doesn't matter which vaccine you choose, unless you have a medical condition which so dictates. We believe that the best vaccine is the one that you can get, but we also understand and respect that it's a personal decision. So as Julie said, please send through your questions. We have over 300 people in attendance tonight, so we'll do our best to get to them, but an apology up front now if we don't get to your specific question. Thank you, Julie. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you. And welcome, if you've just joined us, people are, are joining as we speak uh, this special webinar, COVID-19 vaccination, what do you need to know? Again, just reminder, questions are through the Q&A section only. You just click down there on the bottom, uh, right hand bottom of your screen, and uh, we will get to as many as possible. Just before we begin, I want to uh, help the panel understand a little bit about what you're thinking right now as our audience. And so I'm going to ask our technical host, Michael, to put up the first of four poll questions. Question number one, and if you could answer this, ladies and gentlemen, your current vaccination status, what most accurately describes your current vaccination status? Please click either two jabs completed, 
one jab done, one to go, no vaccination as yet. Please complete. And I'll ask Michael to show us the results. Two jabs completed, 69%. One jab and one to go, 20%. No vaccination yet, 11%. Thank you very much. Our second poll question, please, Michael. Vaccination intentions. If you've not yet been vaccinated, which of the following applies? Just one of them, please. You have an appointment to commence vaccination. I am waiting until I can get Pfizer or Moderna. Just haven't got around to it, but take whatever vaccine I can get. Still undecided as to whether I will get vaccinated. I have no intention of being vaccinated against COVID. If you could click the one that applies to you, please. And the answer, please, Michael. So 38% have a, an appointment to commence vaccination. 21% are waiting until they can get Pfizer or Moderna. No one uh, is thinking they just haven't got round to it. So you're all thinking and you're here, thank you. 29% are still undecided as to whether I will get vaccinated. And 13%, I have no intention of being vaccinated against COVID. Thank you very much. That's obviously out of that smaller group that haven't uh, gone forward yet. Our third question, please. Have reports of very rare side effects caused by the AstraZeneca vaccine deterred you from actually being vaccinated? Yes or no? And the answer, please. 20% saying yes. Reports of a very rare side effect have deterred you and 80% no. Thank you again. And we have one last question. Delta impact. If you were hesitant to be vaccinated, did the arrival of Delta, the Delta strain increase the likelihood of you wanting to be vaccinated? Yes, no, I wasn't hesitant to be vaccinated. And the answer, please. 22% are saying yes. Uh, if you, uh, they, I'll just say yes, because you know the question. 22% are saying yes, 7% are saying no, and 71% are saying I wasn't hesitant to be vaccinated. So still a number there uh, uh, who, are, who are thinking. Look, thank you so much for filling that out. And I hope that was useful. Uh, to our panel. Look, it gives me great pleasure now to welcome to the screen uh, members of our panel discussion. And I'd be asking Professor Mary Louise McClaws, uh, Dr. Ginny Mansberg, and Associate Professor Jason Tangan to turn on their, uh, their uh, microphones, uh, their, their pictures and their, so we can see them. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just uh, so pleased that we're finally having this discussion because I'm so looking forward to hearing what people are saying. I'm, tripping over my words. Now, Dr. Mary Lu Louise McClaws, I think we're seeing constantly on television, uh, an epidemiologist from the University of New South Wales and a member of the World Health Organization advisory panel on COVID-19. And this is how we welcome people. Even if you're at home and we can't see you, we encourage you to engage in deaf side clapping. I'd also like to welcome Dr. Ginny Mansberg, who's a general practitioner in the very multicultural area of San Susi. Uh, she's also very involved with the media in terms of public health messaging on Sunrise, on Seven, Medicine or Myth on SBS and the Embarrassing Bodies Down Under program on Channel 9. So a welcome to you. And also from Queensland, Associate Professor Jason Tangan uh, from the Tangan Lab at the University of Queensland and a, a cognitive scientist with a, a particular interest in decision making and uh, communicating uncertainty. So thank you to our panel, but right up, I'm going to invite Simon Strum to join us, if I would. If you could uh, come on screen, Simon. And Simon and uh, his family have had, I'm sorry to say, direct recent experience with COVID. 
Simon, can you tell us what happened to your family as concisely as you can uh, in recent times? Sure. Um, hi, Julie. And I'll just quickly thanks to Richard Glass for uh, organising this. Um, so about six weeks ago, we weren't in any rush to go get a vaccine. We were complacent. We thought Sydney and the rest of the country was pretty much the safest place in the world to be. So we were watching and waiting to see what everyone else was doing. My son uh, then came home on a Friday night and we went for Friday night dinner. By the Sunday, we had New South Wales Health calling us saying that uh, he was a close contact. And then on the Monday, he was positive for COVID-19, the Delta variant. Um, by the Tuesday, I started showing symptoms and the dinner we went to on Friday, basically everybody at that dinner was also now showing symptoms as well. Um, luckily, they were all in isolation because they were all a close contact. Um, I guess we weren't too concerned because we felt that maybe we'll just get a little cold or a bit of a flu. So no real sort of concern in, in the beginning. However, a few days into it, we realized that that wasn't the case. Um, my son lost his taste, his smell, a couple of little sore throats and headaches, not really too, too concerning. Remind us how I, old are you, Simon? So Jason's 14. And for me, I started getting flu-like symptoms, the headaches, the cold, the, the cough, shivers, shakes, not aches, but sharp pains. And then all of a sudden, um, as time progressed, it just got worse and worse. And every day, New South Wales Health would call from the hospital and ask how I'm doing, and they would take our OBS. And on one of the days, I had trouble with my vision. I couldn't see. Everything was blurry. And for almost two days, I could hardly open my eyes. So that's when they sent me off to hospital. And just um, a quick snapshot of what it looked like when they came to get you, because I think you found that quite traumatic, didn't you? Look, I've actually never been in an ambulance before. I've never had to go to hospital. I'm, you know, touch wood. I've, I've been quite uh, healthy. And so to have, you know, the ambulance out the front of the house spending almost 30 minutes preparing for me as a positive COVID patient to go into the ambulance. They were covering up all their equipment with towels. They were putting on their PPE. And it was something almost like out of a movie. It's something I'd obviously never seen before. And it created, a, I guess, a little bit of concern in the local area because all of a sudden I've got ambulance drivers in full PPE. They've been there for a while. It's creating a little bit of a crowd. I come out in a robe with the mask on and there are people who know me, my neighbors, um, people from down the road where I work, wondering what's happening. And, and as they started to approach to see if I was okay, you've got ambulance drivers um, telling them to get back, saying, you know, get back, get back. And so it, it was just surreal, you know, even going to the hospital, being in an isolation ward, I've obviously never experienced that. And, you know, having the doctors stay as far away as they could, communicating through glass and just really, really confronting. And for the first time, I guess, I was actually quite fearful because I didn't know if my eyesight was going to be a permanent issue. So, yeah, I, I got pretty scared. And, and I would not normally ask this question bluntly, but this is a world in which suddenly our age appears to matter. How old are you? So I, I turned 50 this year. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we didn't have a birthday party, <laughs> but um, I still consider myself to be pretty active. I go to the gym twice a week. I walk almost every day. I've got the dog. I, I play sport. So again, I guess in our decision-making process, we, we felt that we were still young, we were still fit, and that if we did catch COVID, it wouldn't be that big a deal. But I, I need to ask you, you know, in order to come to our panel, I guess the lesson, the one or two lessons you want to share with your community that you've learned from this experience, because it is quite shocking. Uh, uh, so what your lessons are, and then if you would, just a snapshot of how you are now. Sure. So... I think the main thing and, and the reason that I want to be in the public and, and to let people know is 
you've got a chance of having no symptoms, sure, but you've also got a chance of dying. So if there's a scale and you, you know, zero is no symptoms and 100 is death, you're going to end up on that scale. The problem is you don't know where you're going to end up. So where we thought we'd be quite low on that scale, it turned out to be you know, probably better than half or three quarters of the way up it. And, and my partner actually got very sick and she still has health, ongoing health issues. Um, I'm having an MRI next week because I have something called COVID fuzz. Uh, apparently you get swelling of the brain. And as a result of that, I have dizziness. I lose my balance. I still have no taste, no smell. This is six weeks after I contracted COVID. Um, I can't concentrate and, and my brain is like a fuzz. So, you know, they, these are things I'd never heard of before. So, And just remind us why you weren't vaccinated and what your view is of that decision now. Well, clearly we didn't feel there was a risk and we also felt that we would not really have a major illness. We thought we'd have a cold, a flu, and, you know, you'd say, oh, well, that was a bit rough, but she'll be right, mate, sort of thing. But it wasn't the case at all. It, it hit us like, a, you know, being hit by a bus. And, and was it partly that, uh, that you were, didn't want AstraZeneca, you were hoping for one of the others? That's correct. You know, we, we were in no rush. We thought we'll give it six months. We'll let everyone else jump in and take the vaccine. And maybe then we'll have a vaccine. And the preference at the time was Pfizer because there were a few questions about the AstraZeneca vaccine. So we, we were really just sitting around on the fence waiting for everyone else. And if I had known what I knew then, I would have taken the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine in a heartbeat because any vaccine would have been better than what we went through and my partner included. So, you know, we, we've learned a lot, but we've learned it through the hard way and hopefully our lessons can go to the community and, and they don't have to make the mistakes we made. And, uh, and it's all right, I think, to ask you, you're in the eastern suburbs of Sydney. That's where you're living. That's correct, yes. Yeah. Look, Simon, obviously it means the world to us to share that experience and we really, really thank you. Thank you so much. Thank That's you. That's right. Thanks for having me on. I'd like to come, if I may, to Mary Louise McClaws, the epidemiologist from the University of New South Wales. Just before my first question, your response there, hearing Simon speak. Yes. Uh, look, I was always very um, concerned when authorities would talk about don't panic, it's, it's mild. And I think that that set up um, an idea that this was going to be a bit like the flu. So while they were trying to ensure that there wasn't a lot of panic, I don't think it helped. I don't prefer, I don't like to use the term mild. I usually use the term non-hospitalized uh, because even if you're at home, you can still feel like a bus has hit you. And Simon's description of brain fog uh, is well known and it can last for a long time. And he's quite right, it's unpredictable. And um, you know, the, a vaccine can prevent all of this. It, um, and regardless of which vaccine you choose, both AstraZeneca, Pfizer, and we'll soon get Moderna, prevent you from having severe illness and hospitalization. So really they both cut down the enormous risk of brain fog, unpredictable fatigue, and, uh, and Ginny, I'm sure, will tell you all about um, any other, you know, major organ um, impact uh, from COVID. And, um, uh, yeah, even, look, the first dose of AstraZeneca or Pfizer will prevent all of those. Neither of the vaccines prevent, uh, at a high level, symptomatic infection. And what we need to get through to the public is is that take that first vaccine to keep you alive and keep you out of hospital so that you don't have any complications from being hospitalized. But you need that second dose. If you're at all slow at getting, getting around to getting that second dose, get it because that second dose not only increases that uh, likelihood that you'll remain outside of hospital and alive, but it cuts that infection transmission cycle because that's where your antibodies really, your neutralizing antibodies really uh, get to a high level. And so the first dose is for yourself, the second dose is for yourself and your community. 
and your and your immediate community. And you know, as Simon has very nicely explained, um, you know, you can't tell who is um, in that early phase of contagiousness. Uh, and he didn't know that his son had been exposed. And this is why, you know, Delta is, I'll just finish because I'm sure you want to ask me another question, but Delta uh, it has a, a shorter incubation period, which means you become in more contagious, uh, about a thousand times more the viral load uh, with any other strain. And so you can really push out those particles and you don't have to be in close proximity with somebody. That 15 minutes uh, doesn't, um, isn't used as a definition of exposure anymore around the world. And, um, and also, uh, you know, it's learned how also to get around uh, young children's uh, immune system. And they, we thought, and we, this is just still a hypothesis. We thought that the previous mutations didn't get into kids because they had fewer ACE2 receptor sites, those receptor sites that the virus needs to get into. Well, this particular Delta, it's learned how to, because you're breathing out a thousand times more particles, one of those is going to find that small number of ACE2 receptor sites, and it's learned how to hang on to them and penetrate fast. And that's why you're going to see more kids with infection than we've ever seen before. There's a couple more questions I want to ask you before I come to Dr. Mansberg, but could I just ask for a little clarification there? You say it's learned. Uh, is the implication okay, yeah. of that that another reason, because we're unashamedly asking the community to get vaccinated tonight, let's be honest. Yes. So this, that's our core message, get vaccinated. Um, but when you say it's learned, is another reason why it's important to get vaccinated is that this is still an unfolding story. And therefore, give yourself the best chance of surviving and your family and community in an unfolding story. Yes, we're, we're learning about the mutation all the time. So we at WHO, we had a, a marathon meeting on Friday night that went until two in the morning about Delta, about the vaccine, about what we know. And we've had previous meetings all during the week about how this may impact infection control. Are we going to start changing uh, guidelines? And we're still the, we're still learning a lot. But what happens with the virus is it changes naturally anyway. But when we put it under pressure, um, either somebody has a, an immune um, illness and it gets into somebody or partially vaccinated. So when you do have dose one, please still consider yourself um, at risk uh, because you don't want this virus to get in you and you're now at the playground, the test tube for this virus to learn how to get around your partially um, primed immune system. So, it, you know, it, this virus will continue to change. And this is one reason why I keep um, asking the public and the authorities to increase the goal, not from 80% of 16 year olds and over, but 80% of the total population, and that's a big ask, but you know, Ginny will tell you how fabulous parents are at getting kids vaccinated in Australia, we're one of the highest. She's got all the, the numbers and the experience, um, but uh, we can get there if we set the goal high enough, because if we leave the total population vaccinated at around 60%, there's very, very good modeling to show that that is a sweet spot for mutation. I beg your pardon. I'm just going to emphasize that the critical message number one from Mary Louise McClaws tonight is that second vaccination matters, not just the first. But I want to go to this question of we don't have the luxury of time, because that's another of your key messages, isn't it? That people need to make a decision. And you have a vision of how people make decisions of uh, rapid adapters or adopters uh, slower and then the slowest. And that what we need to do is to focus now on those in the Jewish community, because that's who we're predominantly talking about tonight, who haven't acted yet because we don't have the luxury of time. Could you speak to that yes. concisely? Uh, absolutely. Now, Jason's the expert in psychology, but when I don't do pandemics, I actually look at patient safety and how to try to get 
uh, doctors and nurses to change practice, very you know, well-learned practices. And so I had to learn uh, behavior. And um, what I have observed, and I've just observed this, nearly, it's nearly fits, uh, that there's a group that are early adopters like myself, then there are those that uh, adopt because the early adopters have shown it's safe. And then there are the last group and they're often called laggards, which I think is unfair. We've got the anti-vaxxers, but we've got a group that in that third, and tonight we've got 29% undecided, who uh, like to take um, a decision slowly. They'll take a, a very slow to decide who to marry, where to go for holidays, uh, how to change um, their job, et cetera. But I'd ask them that while they fit in with this uh, theory, please don't take too much time. You don't have the time to, to make a decision about this really important vaccine. And remember your mum and dad or whoever was looking after you when you were a kid didn't take time. When there was a polio vaccine, they put your arm out and you know, you're know you well because of that. Please don't take too much time. We don't have it. Now I'm going to come back and, and, and I will be later talking to Jason about decision-making because that's so crucial. But before we come to our first set of questions, I want to welcome Dr. Ginny Mansberg, a general practitioner with over 30 years of experience uh, working out of San Susie, a multicultural area. I, I think one of your key messages Ginny, is that getting vaccinated is an act for our community, that it's what we do as Australians. I, I think Simon has brought home the enormous need to protect oneself and one's family, but can you tell us more why you see it as a almost a community obligation? Yeah, and g'day everyone. I am also sitting on uh, the Eora lands of uh, the uh, Gadigal lands of the Eora Nation, so I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past present and emerging. So yeah, I think um, I am actually practicing in one of what we call an area of concern. So um, my patients all have to wear a mask all the time and um, they've got some slightly stricter um, restrictions because the rates of uh, COVID are so high for my patients. What I've been, um, we've got a very high rate of vaccine scepticism um, in the local government area where I practice. And I've been trying to engage with people around not just thinking about this as a personal journey, so what you're adopting for yourself, but the way we all need to get vaccinated to reach these critical numbers. Mary Louise just made an excellent case about the fact that you just can't say 60% of people can do it. I'm not interested. It doesn't work for me. I don't like the sound of the vaccines because that leaves the entire community vulnerable, including mums who are doing it tough because homeschooling is just literally wreaking havoc with their lives um, and uh, people whose small businesses that they've worked their entire life for are going to pieces. People who are getting sick, the elderly who don't have any immune system to battle this, people who for various reasons are, are very unwell and are really going to cop it. What you do is an act of love for everybody in your community and please don't think about it just about a very, very personal decision around getting a vaccine. You've mentioned there that there's high degrees of um, hesitancy uh, or whatever word one prefers to use in your community. And I think you've also are experiencing a lot of misinformation. And, and my understanding is that you think it's critical we communicate to those we love in our community that these vaccines have been more successful than anyone could have anticipated. What's your message there? I just feel like it was not that long ago that we were all saying, we don't even know if we're gonna get a vaccine to this COVID. Uh, we had tried coronavirus vaccines before, they had been a complete debacle, they hadn't worked. We flu vaccines, we have entire years where at best we're gonna get 35% efficacy um, uh, in, in the real world or effectiveness in the real world. We didn't know what we'd be able to achieve. These vaccines have literally knocked the ball out of the park. We've been amazed at what they've been able to achieve. So I guess, that is a really big component. But I think what we're going to hear from Jason is really critical in this because just pounding people with information is not the missing link to get people to, to get vaccinated. I think doctors can come across as incredibly patronising and thundering people with facts, which makes, them, makes, makes us sound uh, patronising and uh, rude and arrogant, and that's unhelpful. We need to engage people where they're at. 
And I think that Pat Turner in the Aboriginal community has really led the way at community control. And we need to pick up that model and see if we can extend that into other communities as well, where there is a high degree of hesitancy because a whitey like me doesn't convince somebody, even if I throw facts at them, it doesn't help. You mentioned this idea of, uh, of the Pat Turner, the so the um, uh, national Aboriginal leader who's working with all the, the network of Ab Aboriginal health services, and it's control and initiated by mem the leadership of the local community. Is that what we're doing tonight, Ginny? I mean, this is in fact the Jewish community leadership reaching out to their community. Is this the sort of model you're actually advocating for? Absolutely. But I think in our community, you can see on the webinar tonight that 11% of people were not vaccinated at all. And a very small number of people, of those people who are not vaccinated, only 13% have decided that they're not going to get vaccinated. When you go out to other communities, those rates are much, much, much higher, particularly where English is not their first language, where the types of information that they're seeking might be predominantly from YouTube or other videos that are shared via email or via WhatsApp their way of communicating is very different. And so I think it's important not, to do, not just to do it in this community, but to do it to in the Sikh community, in the Arabic speaking community, in the Afghan community, every single community where there is some degree of hesitancy or where we're not doing a great job of bringing them on board on our journey. We need to be resourcing that sector more and engaging the community more so that we bring them along at their level. Look, thank you so much. And Jason, I'm dying to hear about cognitive science, but I'm just going to go to the audience first and I'll be back to you in our next segment. But could I welcome now our question moderator, Richard Glass, who will start us uh, with some questions. Thank you. Hi, Julie. I'm going to break your rule and ask a couple of questions together, if I may, because they are very closely related. Um, <clears throat> and, and this is probably the most common question that's been asked um, through registrants and actually on, on um, screen tonight. So once vaccinated, how long does immunity last? Will we be required to have boosters? How will we know when we need to get a booster? And will we have a choice of brand? Okay, uh, now I may get you to repeat, because trust me, people often do like repetition. Just tell me the first question again, one. So how long does immunity last? And, and, and how long? Now what was well, the let's first Let's stay with question? that one. Sorry? How long does immunity last? Okay, so I can answer that one. So um, uh, a, a colleague of mine, Miles Davenport, has done a wonderful uh, paper, leading paper, looking at uh, neutralizing antibodies. Now, there will, there will be immunologists on this um, webinar, and they'll say neutralizing antibodies isn't the only thing that helps you fight this disease. There's T cells, um, but neutralizing antibodies have been correlated very well with the levels of protection. And uh, Miles Davenport did a great uh, uh, examination of uh, the vaccine efficacy and how, at let's say 90%, how fast those neutralizing antibodies fell to about uh, 50% and how fast they fell when, say, the vaccine efficacy was less at about 80%. And as a rough guide, um, let's say that somewhere between eight months and 12 months, uh, neutralizing antibodies uh, start to wane and we'll have to start thinking about having seasonal boosters. So on Friday night at WHO, they're not happy about boosters because they believe in vaccine equity around the world, but um, and we know that Israel, that tonight news has come out that Israel has commenced boosting. So that's 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 right. So a, a quick uh, thought on boosting. Uh, well, uh, a, a friend of mine actually uh, got boosted uh, tonight. Uh, well, it was this morning in Israel on um, Shtem Esrei uh, channel, and um, she's uh, she's in her fifties. Uh, so they're uh, rolling it out from the older group. Uh, to th through to the middle age group, uh, but it has it was shown on Friday night that it is uh, very effective at boosting, uh, and they are going for not the mix and match. So if you have AstraZeneca, get your booster with AstraZeneca. If you have Pfizer, with Pfizer. But there is a study by Imperial College looking at uh, having a what's called mix and match. 
AstraZeneca Pfizer or Pfizer AstraZeneca. But I believe that eventually we may have to have, if we've all had AstraZeneca, a messenger RNA because it will be tweaked and they can be tweaked faster than uh, the, the, you know, the ones that have been made in the old fashioned style like AstraZeneca and, uh, and they can tweak it for any um, mutation. And just before I leave you, uh, uh, Mary Louise, do we have any sense of what the plans are in Australia or are we right now just so focused on getting 80% plus having both vaccinations of whatever kind that we haven't moved to that planning yet? Yeah, yeah. So uh, we really do need to start thinking about getting more product because we really will need to start boosting those that were first of all the first cab off the rank uh, for the um, the elderly, uh, the immunosuppressed, you know, the, the compassionate framework that we rolled out initially. So they will have to start being vaccinated again eventually in about maybe eight months or so. Uh, and I'm sure uh, that the authorities are already thinking about this. Certainly um, Ginny and I are, are on a um, immunization coalition and and, and we're talking about it and, you know, others will as well. And of course, Australia is seeing what Israel is doing and Israel and America and the UK set the scene for this. The UK are only boosting um, kids who have an immune um, uh, disorder or live with somebody who has an immune um, issue. Uh, the US, are starting to think about rolling it out. And I noticed one of the questions was about why are we getting, they didn't term it this way, but it, they're talking about vaccine breakthrough, infections with people who've had vaccine. And it's because of mutations or because um, they never elicited a great um, response initially. Not everybody does. The older you get, uh, you know, your immune system gets a bit tireder. And, um, when we talk about vaccine efficacy, we're not talking 100%, sadly. So there'll always be, you know, that proportion who are at risk of acquiring infection. Um, I was going to see if I, uh, sorry, if I could get a comment from Ginny, and then I'll come back to you, Richard, for the next question. Did you want to comment, Ginny? Um, not much uh, else to add. I just think it's interesting in the data in Israel is that those who are vaccinated first in January are getting more breakthrough infections. So it does seem to be that sort of waning immunity than those who were vaccinated more recently. In the US at the moment, 97% of people who are in hospital with COVID, and the numbers are still big on Australian level, you know, much bigger than here, 97% of them are actually unvaccinated. So there will be a little bit of breakthrough infection, but what we're not seeing in those who've been vaccinated is severe disease requiring hospitalisation and far less death. Okay, good old death. Okay, Richard, can you yeah give us another question, please? Uh, turn yourself on. Sorry, um, a second question related. <clears throat> pardon me. Is when will people actually know when they're meant to get a booster? How will people be advised or work out? Who would like to answer that one, Mary Louise? Well, I'll start, but Ginny will know as well um, because the government will advise her about um, sending out reminders. I imagine Atagi will probably um, be meeting to discuss this. They'll um, put together a statement or a piece of advice and, and the government will probably follow the advice from Natagi. They usually do. Let's have another question, Richard, before we come back to the panel. Certainly. Um, quite a few questions about herd immunity based on the fact that there's been a lot of discussion in Australia around in New South Wales about getting to say 80% vaccination of adults or, and of course there's 20% then that aren't vaccinated. So what are the implications for that? And is it inevitable that that other 20% will at some point get COVID? Who'd like to go? Well, can I, can I start by saying it's not just the 20%, it's 80% of the 16 and over, and they represent 80% of the total population. So it's 80% of 80%, which sadly is 64% of the total population. Now that would have been okay had this virus decided not to infect anybody younger than 16, but it will infect everybody now. We're not talking about the wild Wuhan strain. So that means that one in three people will not be protected. 
Can you just take one step back and remind us what is herd immunity and what proportion of the total population would have to be vaccinated? Oh, you tell me what what is your, what is herd immunity and and what should we be aiming for as a protection for our society? Okay, um, herd immunity is a calculation that we do based on what the transmissibility is, and at the moment that seventy percent of the adult population and eighty percent of the adult population was based on a transmissibility level that is so much lower than Delta at the moment. So on Friday night, uh, we were told that the transmissibility, the R naught is five, but you can give it anything, however many people turn Explain up. Explain what that means, okay. Mary Louise. That Everything's means... got to be clear to a year Sorry. 12 student. Quite. So uh, if I'm infected, I can, I can pass it on effectively to five others. They can pass it on to five others, et cetera. So you can see how fast it travels. So in an average flu season, Ginny, do remind me if I've got this right, an average flu season, uh, we might, a normal flu season, we might uh, pass it on to 1.1 other. And then in a bad flu season, about 1.5, Ginny, would that be about right? Yeah, that's a, that's yeah. a nasty. And I think measles is mm. the worst at, with an R0 of 12. Yeah. The five is yeah. horrific because we yes. used to say 1.8 for the Wuhan strain, wasn't it? it was mm -hmm. meant to be Correct. Yeah. Correct. So... So the calculation includes the R0, so the, the five, then the proportion who will get Pfizer and the proportion that will get AstraZeneca. That you, and, the, and then of course the vaccine efficacy for that proportion. And then you come up with a number. So um, that 80% of the 80% is too low. And I believe that maybe we were told that because the model was old. I mean, I did it um, very, very briefly uh, at the beginning of the year when America, the FDA approved uh, 16 year olds and even 12 year olds to 15 on the 10th of May this year. And Israel was already starting to roll out to younger kids as well. So I rejigged it and we, we really need 95% of that population from 12 and over. It's huge. And can I can I, only... I, I just want to bang in here because our purpose tonight is to encourage everybody to get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Our message so far is there isn't time to wait. And what I'm struggling with is what does this discussion of herd immunity mean in relation to that purpose? Is, Thank what, you, Julie. What's the takeaway message? Absolutely. Yeah. The takeaway take message is don't set a bar everybody that you're list, that is listening tonight if you love your community and we are a very strong community get vaccinated because we need as many of you as possible 80% preferably 95% of the whole whole australian population that's going to be a bit of an effort but ginny will tell you she sees her um, mums and dads come in and vaccinate at 94% of bubs who need to have their injections between zero and five. We need to take the vaccine to the people. And Jason will talk about this, of course, about how we do it. But Israel has four holim, so four insurance groups, and they just WhatsApp you and they tell you where to turn up. So they're not taking it to you, but they're dragging you to the vaccine. And that's what we need to do. I'm sorry. What I'm going to do, Richard, if I may, is come to Jason and then I'll come back to you. Jason, you've been referred to so often, it's time we met you. And I'm reminding our audience that uh, Jason is an Associate Professor of Cognitive Science uh, at the University of Queensland in the School of Psychology. And he has expertise and research interest in decision-making and communicating uncertainty. You know, it was very interesting for me listening to that conversation about vaccine hesitant, uh, sorry, about herd immunity. And I'm thinking, how does this relate to whether we should have a vaccine or not? And in a way, it was an example of the complexity of scientific information. I've got a few uni degrees, but I was having a bit of trouble working it out. And I, I know one of your areas of interest is how do you effectively communicate scientific information? So could we come to that first? 
Yeah, We're sure. trying to give people facts, but how do we do it in a way that will influence them? Yeah, you're exactly right. Um, we're all pretty bad at dealing with uh, really large numbers and small probabilities. So, for example, saying that COVID has a 0.004% chance of killing someone is pretty meaningless uh, for most people who aren't used to dealing with these sort of probabilities. So uh, I think it's better to frame things in real numbers that people can actually picture in their heads. Uh, for example, the risk of dying from a blood clot uh, is one in two million. But even then, we're terrible at thinking about huge numbers like two million, right? We often don't distinguish between million, billion, and trillion. They sound a lot uh, alike, even though they're orders of magnitude larger in size, but uh, we treat them similarly. Um, but if you present this probability as a photo, uh, it can be really powerful. Uh, I think his name, Hassan Valley from La Trobe University, has a really nice uh, one in the conversation you might have seen, where he tries to show the chance of uh, one in uh, two million in pixels on the screen, right? So one single pixel is just a single tiny dot, and two million is just a huge patch of red pixels on the screen that you have to keep scrolling through uh, to be able to see them all. Uh, and when you frame risk this way, then people seem to understand it a lot better. Um, another way of, of doing it is to compare it to other one-off events that, uh, that we might encounter, uh, which he did in that piece as well, and talking about, um, say, the risk of bungee jumping, which is uh, two in a million chance of dying uh, in that sort of circumstance, or rock climbing, or running a marathon, which is seven in a million, uh, or scuba diving, 10 in a million. Um, so the risk of dying is far lower uh, than many activities that most of us end up doing in these sort of one-off events, but more common risks like, you know, a pedestrian accident or drowning or a car accident is far, far more likely, uh, but it's less of a, it's not a good comparison because they're over a year and uh, of, it, it isn't a one-off event like, like getting a, a jab. So, so what you're saying is try and use uh, real like comparable examples that we can imagine and use pictures. But as I understand from our poll, and someone will correct me if I've got this wrong, we've got people watching this tonight mm -hmm. who still haven't had a vaccine right, and right. some who are still deciding whether to have a vaccine. And we've got experts saying, hurry up, you haven't got time to wait. That's where we're at. What are some of the dilemma, the mental difficulties that people engage in when they're trying to assess risk? Mm. Help us to understand some, I guess they're almost got a kind of thinking error. So what are the dilemmas people face in thinking and then any thoughts on how we can help people overcome them to save lives? Yeah, you're right again. I think there's, I mean, I, I teach a course actually called uh, The Science of Everyday Thinking. Uh, which deals with a lot of these sort of issues. Um, and we essentially cover a bunch of shortcuts that people use uh, and traps that people rely on when thinking about um, these sort of everyday events. And of, of one is you know, COVID vaccination and risk. Um, and one of these traps I think is quite common is called the availability heuristic. Uh, so the idea there is we think about probability and risk by um, the examples that come to mind. So the easier an idea or a thought or a risk is to bring to mind, the more weight we tend to give it, right? So if we're comparing two risks, the one that comes to mind first is the one that will weight more heavily. So uh, this shortcut works most of the time, but sometimes it goes horribly wrong, right? So people often believe that murder occurs more than suicide or people, uh, more people die in fires than in drowning. Or we're more worried about dying in a plane crash than a car crash, even though uh, more than three Australians die in a car crash every day, right? So when you think about these risks and when you think about these sorts of events, it's just how easily they, they, they pop into mind. And the same goes for uh, reports of vaccine side effects, right? Dying from AstraZeneca, um, then you, you can easily think about the number of people that have died or that have had so severe side effects, then you can all the people who have quietly lived their lives who are saved by it, right? They don't come to mind because you never hear about them, right? What doesn't fl flood to mind are the many tens of thousands of people who got the jab without any ill effects whatsoever. But of course, these examples don't come to mind because we don't hear about them. So there are some people watching this right now hesitate, that they're, they're not 
vaccinated because they're afraid of a risk mm. or they're not vaccinated because they won't take AstraZeneca and they're waiting for Pfizer or something else. What advice would you give them in terms of how to think through their circumstances? Yeah, I mean, we talk about some of these traps that, that people tend to fall into, but we're not at the whim of these necessarily, right? We're smarter than that. We can actually, we can do complex things like long division and taxes. <laughs> we're not, uh, we can, we're not at the whims of these sort of traps in our everyday thinking. And so we can kind of stop, take a breath and think through rationally about what the correct sort of response is. I mean, and it's funny, just, just before, it was March last year, uh, in 2020, and one of the students in one of my lectures tested positive. He was one of the first uh, in Brisbane that was uh, that tested positive, and so it was quite scary. But around that time, in fact, a couple of weeks later, I was scheduled to fly to Nepal. Uh, we were my partner and I were going to Nepal to um, hike to Everest Base Camp. So we got stuck with every jab under the sun. <laughs> we got uh, meningi meningococcal, typhoid, hep B, hep A, everything. We didn't think anything of it because that's what you do. You go to the GP, you get all these jabs. Um, and at no point did I weigh even the risk of any of those sort of things, but we're kind of in a totally different world at the moment where we almost have too much information as a result of this completely dominating our lives all the time. And so, we're able, we're in a very sort of luxurious position to be able to weigh the minute differences between particular vaccines, which I think is almost um, almost silly in, in some respects, especially when we're going to be talking in, in the future about boosters and uh, mixing vaccines. It's, it's, it's going to be a complete non-issue soon. Thank you so much. Just before I come to you, Richard, I want to come to a young woman, Chloe De Winter, and, and Chloe's 30. And we've just been hearing about decision-making, Chloe, but you decided to get AstraZeneca. Can you introduce yourself? And I should say that uh, Chloe uh, is from Melbourne, but currently in Queensland and is the founder of Go Chloe Pilates, an online Pilates platform, and at some point is going to help me uh, to get a, um, what are they called, a core. <laughs> but uh, tell us, why did you decide to get AstraZeneca? You're 30. I know. Um, the main reason is that I just felt really helpless. The government, I was following everything the government was telling me to do. I was locking down when I needed to way too many times in Melbourne. Um, I was following all of those health objectives, but they are telling us we need to get vaccinated. And as a young person, I felt so helpless that I couldn't do that. And so a few people around me started getting AstraZeneca and I started to look into it and I weighed up the risks. And to me, it was a very obvious decision. And I went in and decided to get the jab and it was the best thing I ever did. And I can't wait to get the second one. <laughs> and why do you say the best thing you ever did? Because it really helped me overcome that feeling of helplessness. The, the current situation in Australia is, is dire. There are so many millions of people in lockdown at the moment. And the only true way forward for us from this point is to actually achieve herd immunity or for us to get vaccinated and to move forward. And I wanted to feel like I was being proactive and part of the solution towards that. You are on TikTok. Just remind people what TikTok is because we have some older people. <laughs> and tell us what you've posted and what happened next. Yeah, TikTok is um, a social media platform which, uh, predominantly appeals to young people. I'm 30 and to be honest, I feel old for TikTok. <laughs> um, but after I got my AstraZeneca vaccine, I uploaded a video of myself coming out with the Band-Aid, the token Band-Aid on my arm, um, uh, some writing saying everyone, the way everyone feels when they're under 60 and they get AstraZeneca and Mariah Carey's hero playing in the background. <laughs> and um, I thought it was quite funny because I did kind of feel like that, but I was just <laughs> making a bit of a joke and clearly it resonated. That video is now at almost 200,000 views on TikTok and is still climbing. <laughs> so, yeah. 
so I just share that with you for the extraordinary power of social media. I, Chloe has sent this to me. I, I've had two AstraZenecas and uh, I uh, have posted on, uh, you know, LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter and I haven't achieved anything like this. I may not be as young and attractive also as, as Chloe, but it is an example of, uh, well, I guess the youthful, I mean, there's a lot of young people on TikTok and they're saying go girl, aren't they? Yeah, predominantly. And yeah, you raise a really good point. Like Ginny, Dr. Ginny was talking about appealing to different communities and finding ways to really get the message out to different communities. And I was able to tap into a new community and I'm sure encourage more people to get vaccinated and, and more young people to consider getting AstraZeneca now before they are eligible for Pfizer. And look, I will share that with everybody and they may uh, post it later. I'm going to come to uh, Richard for questions, but Ginny, a quick comment from you. I can see you're busy and I know what a practical GP is like. You're probably answering questions online. But um, well, how do you respond to that 200,000 young people? You know, there's an enthusiasm there that's very different from the community. You've given us a sense where people are resisting the decision. Yeah, but interestingly, I'm seeing many more young people of Chloe's age, so community minded, so it, these are good people who are ethical and they all say, I am doing this for my community. I'm doing this for everyone else. I have got so many young people saying, let's just do this. The hesitancy is actually coming from the older people. So I'm seeing a lot of 50 plus year olds who are saying I'm not interested I don't want to get it it gives you cancer it makes you infertile they're 50 yes, I'm kind yes of don't uh, uh, um, I think it's best not to repeat the misinformation that's just something I was going to come to Jason about later but they have a whole lot of uh bobomyces uh, we call it what do you call them bobomyces it's in the the Yiddish it's rubbish but anyway it's all it's all, all the all the rubbish that they, that they come up with but it's um the, the young ones, um, that's my favourite consultation because these guys are, they're so good and they are so enthusiastic and it's also, they're like, all my friends have gone and done this as well. So it's not um, that they're just doing it on their own. There'll often be 16 of them in a WhatsApp group who go to the pharmacy and get it done. It's amazing and really life-affirming, I think. Um, I, yeah, I'm so proud of everybody who does that. And thank you. Very, very grateful. Yeah, well said, Ginny. Well said. Chloe, thank you. And I'll come now to Richard for uh, some more audience questions, please. Thanks, Julie. Um, a couple of questions around the fact um, that young kids can't be vaccinated at the moment. And unlike Alpha, um, the, the current strain Delta is far more contagious. So looking for advice around or advice to parents with young kids as to what they should do until such time as kids can be vaccinated. Can I come to Mary Louise and then Ginny, you come in for anything additional? So where are we up to in terms of the age at which young people can get vaccinated? And I think there are differences between states, aren't there? Well, the, the um, uh, TGA approved 12 to 15 year olds to receive the vaccine. FDA in America are doing research in five-year-old to 11-year-olds and um, six months, years of age to four years, uh, looking at uh, smaller doses. So I think as soon as America starts showing us the safety uh, in the kids under 12, uh, we may be considering the risk versus um, the um, uh, you know the, the, the benefits. Uh, certainly the 12 years old and over, uh, the US uh, provided a lot of safety uh, data and they've been injecting uh, 12 year olds to, um, to 15 year olds now. And as I mentioned, it is legal in Australia. It's just that Australian authorities had focused on a phasing uh, approach and they haven't included kids yet because I don't uh, think that um, they may not have enough um, vaccine yet. So we do need the 20 uh, or the 16 to 39 year olds. They are the group that's, that's you know, have most infections. 49% of all local cases, locally acquired cases since the beginning last year are in uh, young people. So I believe that once we get the 
younger group vaccinated, uh, the government may then open up to 12 to 15 year olds, particularly as we're st starting to see kids at school not having, not getting it from uh, family clusters like they did with the Wuhan strain or the American strain, uh, getting it from each other. Um, and of course, there's a schools in um, Melbourne as well. And of course, now in Sydney, sadly, um, a school for um, special needs kids as well. So uh, special need kids, uh, Ginny will talk to this, but um, uh, you know that they will be um, a priority, but everybody, all other kids should be, they'll probably just have to wait their turn. And epidemiologically, if I was running it, I'd say, please, you know, I think Ginny and others have said the group that are the most resistant are not the young. And the, and the young students at my university are stunning, just like as Ginny has said, she must have been to my university recently because they are getting a campaign ready they're amazing. It's the 40 year olds to around 69 years who are a bit slow. Uh, but so epidemiologically, I'd ask to them, please get, um, get your second or even your first dose done. Then that epidemiologically important group. And then the next priority is kids. But well, um, over to Ginny. Yes, thank you, Ginny. Oh, look, I just couldn't reiterate that enough. I think, Mary Louise, you've been talking about that 20 to 30-year-old age group since I can remember saying way before we were in this current outbreak, you said these will be the guys who are spreading it. We came into an outbreak and guess what? Um, you know, it's terrible being right, but it's, it's exactly what has happened. Um, and this is the group that has struggled to get access to a Pfizer vaccine. They are the ones spreading it. They are our essential workers. And yet, amazingly, they have stepped up to the plate, particularly the younger ones in that cohort. And just um, the minute the government said, go and get an AstraZeneca, whatever vaccine you can, they've just been amazing, much better than what we thought was going to happen, which has left this particular group um, unvaccinated and vulnerable. And I'm just going to say we've got a lot of questions, so let's try and get through a few with a, a little bit more brevity, please, even though everything you say is interesting. Richard. Should a, a pregnant woman or a woman who's planning pregnancy be vaccinated? I might come to Ginny, if I may. Um, yes, so uh, with caveats. So at this point in Australia, only the Pfizer vaccine has been approved for pregnancy. Um, whereas if you're planning to get pregnant, you can get the AstraZeneca vaccine. It's also the only one that's been approved for breastfeeding women. At the moment in New South Wales, we have now got uh, pregnant women as a priority. And so they are in, um, a, a, they do have access to the Pfizer vaccine. Unfortunately, breastfeeding women do not. So they can't get the AstraZeneca vaccine. They also can't get the Pfizer vaccine because they're currently, most of them are not in the age group where they're qualifying for it. So that's a really big black hole for our community, unfortunately. We know that pregnant women have a much higher risk of severe COVID, and there also is uh, risks with preterm birth, early delivery, and poor outcomes all the way through to the first six weeks after delivery. So yes, it's, it's recommended by RANSCOG, the Royal Australian New Zealand College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and you are approved for it once you're pregnant to get the Pfizer vaccine. If you're not pregnant yet, then you can't get the Pfizer vaccine unless you fall into a special group. And so that's the AstraZeneca. And just any international experience from you, Mary Louise, on that pregnancy question that you think is important to know? Oh, just um, that Israel has been um, injecting with Pfizer um, pregnant you know, women uh, because they believe that the risk of um, uh, COVID was greater than the risk, any risk associated with Pfizer. But can I just remind you, there's a fantastic new paper out. It comes from Spain. And I'll, I'll be brief, uh, Julie, I promise. And it basically reminds us that the adverse events for both Pfizer and AstraZeneca, all but for thrombocytopenia, are same, the same. So uh, it's really very reassuring that, um, that you know, uh, both of these uh, vaccines are great. Thank you. A another question, Richard? Is it only people who are severely ill with COVID who suffer from long COVID? Oh, that's an interesting one. Ginny, do you want to have a go first and then I'll come to Mary Louise? 
So most of the studies that were done early were done to follow up people who had been admitted to hospital. So the data that we had early uh, was, yes, mostly done in people who had had severe COVID. It seems that it's you don't need to have had severe COVID. What we're looking at is it's mostly, um, it's more common in women. It's more common in people who catch COVID in middle age rather than um, younger people. They're less likely to get it. Um, and we're settling on, it looks around 10% because it's got to last for more than four weeks to be called this sort of long haul uh, COVID. But in really good news, um, I think we weren't too sure, but it really does look like vaccination dramatically cuts your risk of getting long COVID. And I thought, um, Simon, and thanks for sharing your story, Simon, that was just a really powerful story. Um, that's just a really salient reminder that someone who's never set foot in a hospital, that's how healthy he was and didn't even know what it was like to be in an ambulance, is now to this day suffering to the extent where, you know, could any of us afford to just go out of the workforce afterwards? It's a really big deal and it should be, don't just think about COVID, about, about killing you. There are other things that happen as well that are really, really awful. Any other comment from you, Mary Louise, on that? Um, just uh, to say that um, I was contacted by a nurse recently who said that she didn't have hospitalised COVID, um, so she was non-hospitalised, but she said it hit her like a bus and she still has uh, such a terrible, uh, unpredictable fatigue that she sadly lost her job because she couldn't work out when she could get to work. And, you know, as you know, um, nurses and doctors have to be able to um, be reliable. Uh, and so you can ruin your, um, you know, your future for quite some time. And um, there are help groups that I'm sure Ginny can put people in touch with. Um, and, and, you know, it's a very big area of uh, research at the moment. It started in the UK when they really started observing it in young, fit people. I'm going to ask uh, more, uh, more questions of you, Richard, in just one sec. I just want to ask Jason... Tangan, our psychologist, our behaviour expert, on one question so I don't miss it because our time will run out. And, and that's this, Jason. You know, earlier someone began to say some of the myths they were hearing and I quickly jumped in and stopped them. Now, what was driving that behaviour in me was I feel like some myths are so powerful in their capacity to influence people that it's, it's a, a risk to even mention the myth. On the other hand, if you don't mention the myth, how do you bust it? And I wondered if we could just have some guidance on that challenging issue, because there'll be some people watching this who are trying to influence people in their community or, or family members who've got misinformation in their head. How do you manage that? Yeah, it's tricky. You're right. Uh, misinformation can certainly do damage. Um, misinformation is spread either by mistake or with intention to mislead, at which point it's disinformation. Um, but misinformation is also really sticky, as you said. So fact-checking can reduce people's beliefs in um, false information, but misinformation often continues to influence people's thinking even after they receive and accept a correction. Um, this is called the continued influence effect. So it obviously, um, persists for some time, as you said. So for example, we know that the best way to sterilize your mask is with detergent and water uh, and then let it dry. But there was a myth going around last year that uh, putting your mask in the microwave with water will sterilize it. Now that's totally false. Uh, not only will microwaving uh, not kill most germs, but it's also a fire hazard, <laughs> right? So instead, putting your mask in the washing machine with other clothes or hand washing it using soap and warm water and then letting it dry is the most effective. But so your question the, is... What's your the question takeaway is, advice? Yeah. Yeah. So should I have even mentioned that microwave myth, right, at all? And I think the answer is absolutely yes. Um, I mentioned I teach this course in critical thinking uh, and... I can't just tell people how to think and reason correctly without also talking about the mistakes that we tend to make as well. Uh, so in order to learn to distinguish between high and low quality information, we need both. And so I think uh, you can't have one without the other. You need to show people where uh, information is bad in order to understand what information is good. I'm going to come to Mary Louise quickly, Richard. It's an important point, and then I'm back to you. 
you know, we are an educated society and yet we have still a significant body of people, even in our group tonight, who are, have not yet got a vaccination. And as I understand it, you've had another briefing from the World Health Organization that's given some data or some information on who are the most likely group to run towards the vaccination and who are the most likely group to hold back. Could you just give it to us, give us that information concisely and how that should influence our behavior going forward as we try to get people vaccinated? Well, uh, it, what often happens globally also happens at home. So if you go to the uh, government website and have a look at vaccination by dosing by age and sex and state, you can see very obviously that the elderly uh, or the mature, um, the, the 70 years and over, have been able to get vaccine. It's been made very available to them and it's been rolled out on a compassionate uh, level. And that has been obvious and it's been around the world. COVAX facility framework where uh, WHO uh, uh, dispenses vaccines um, to, to members, uh, dispense it hoping that it will go to a compassionate framework of the elderly and the frontline workers. So they have been getting it. There's no problem. Uh, their second dose level in Australia is up to 50% to of that age group. And that's the highest um, uptake of second doses. It, and the young have been uh, neglected terribly around the world. But as um, you know, Ginny has spoken and, and of course, um, our, uh, our young um, Chloe has, uh, has also demonstrated they will take it up. They just haven't had the access. And uh, with people like Chloe spreading the news that it's safe, um, then they will start taking up AstraZeneca. Um, the reason that I quite like young having Pfizer is there's only 28 days between the first and the second dose when you've got circulating um, variant of concern. But it's that 40 to 69 year old age group that is slow to take it up. And but isn't I, there also a, a, a division between those who are, are well educated and in a higher oh, socioeconomic yes, group yes, compared yeah, to absolutely. those who are unemployed, disaffected, or poor? Yes, and that's yes, the. Absolutely. So Israel has actually shown this very well, and so has America, that the those with, on the higher socioeconomic level, uh, for most of those age groups, um, pick it up very well. Uh, but it's those who are underemployed uh, and um, outside of um, society. You know, they. They, they are not fitting in, they may have mental ill health, they don't have a job, they've got a lot of things they worry about, let alone a vaccine. And they're the group, like our homeless, like our underemployed, we need to go to them. And we can't think that everybody's okay if they're not brought along uh, with us. And, the, um, and Israel had had that problem of trying to get that group at, towards the end. I just wanted to share that with our community tonight because we have to give thought as to how that population because will get vaccinated because this is a, a virus that is so um, infectious and easily transmitted that we need everybody we, it's to, to be vaccinated, don't we, for all of us to be safe. So I just wanted that uh, because that critical thinking that Jason's talking about is often learned in the higher levels of high school or at university or TAFE. But coming to you, Richard, let's try and get a couple more questions done. Sorry. Sure, no problem at all. Um, if someone is fully vaccinated, can they still um, be infected and pass the virus on to others? Ginny? Yeah, so no vaccine is perfect. Um, we've got pretty good data that both the AstraZeneca and Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna one that's coming in soon, you'll be able to get that from your pharmacy. They are all very effective, um, over 90% effective of keeping you out of hospital and against death. What, um, what we did think in the beginning was that the vaccine halved um, the viral load coming out of uh, people who were infected. But there was some data that came out of the CDC that show, showing that uh, uh, the Centre for Disease Control in Atlanta in, in America, showing that in fact people who 
catch COVID at all, even though they get a milder form, are still emitting very high amounts of virus from themselves. Now, that is a concern because then that really does put the unvaccinated at enormous risk because they can be walking through the community, they can come across people who are vaccinated, feel great, are not aware that they're carrying the disease and are actually passing huge amounts of virus out to, you know, out to others. So we know that at the moment, 50% of people who catch COVID catch it for some, from somebody who has no symptoms whatsoever. We now know that temperature scanners are absolutely useless. They do nothing to prevent the spread of COVID. But what we do know is that this new Delta strain, it has a huge viral load. As Mary Louise was saying, it's an enormous viral load at a different level. And yes, you can still pass it to others, even when you've been vaccinated and feel okay yourself. I might come to another question, unless Mary Louise, there's something crucial you think needs to be added? No, thank you. Richard, another question, please. Would it help if people who were fully vaccinated were allowed certain privileges, whether that's attending you know, cinemas, events, et cetera, and unvaccinated people not allowed to attend those? Would that be an incentive to increase the number of people who do get vaccinated? Mary Louise, can I come to that? Because mm. WHO must be talking about that. Mm. So human rights, uh, you've got to constantly think about human rights all the time. And um, oh, the other day, uh, Arthur Moses, uh, Patrick uh, Kayser and Henry uh, Cooper, three um, barristers uh, put on an excellent webinar about what employers are allowed to do if there is no alternative. And this is what WHO expects. Uh, if there's an alternative such as testing people um, and they can test them with rapid antigen tests to go into mass um, social venues, for example, or on a plane, then you've got to let them on. Um, if, of course, they work with vulnerable people, patients, for example, uh, then you can give them advice that you will expect them uh, to have a vaccine. You just have to give them a uh, warning. Uh, so, yeah, uh, take a message, get vaccinated. Um, but if but there will be people who can't be medically vaccinated and there will be those religiously or for cultural reasons haven't been able to take up AstraZeneca. But now we're getting more Pfizer, more Moderna. That a problem has been negated. Got a couple of questions here from people who say that um, their yoga teacher, their dentist, um, has asked them to not attend their class or an appointment for two weeks from the time of vaccination due to the possibility of toxic vaccine shedding. Is that true? Uh, Jenny, no. can I come to you? No. I mean, it's, I kind of, you know, I understand that a yoga teacher probably hasn't done a science degree. Many of them have, but a lot of them haven't. But I'm really surprised that a dentist would think that, you know, really a small piece of not the entire spike protein, but a small amount of a, of a spike protein of a virus could actually reconstruct itself into an entire virus and then shed out of your immune system. Scientifically, that's simply not plausible. That's very disappointing that that would have come from one of our dental colleagues. Thank you. Richard, another question? Yes, um, it's similar to one of the others, but is, is it safe to be vaccinated if you're being treated for cancer or have had recent cancer treatment? Ginny, I'll come to you again there. Yes, so um, we there's sort of no evidence that there it, it certainly doesn't run amok in your body and turn into um, a huge amount of uh, virus. So it's not a live vaccine, for example, like some of the shingles uh, vaccines. Um, but if you have any concerns, speak to your oncologist. What we were seeing was some concerns of people who were on immune suppressant drugs, would the vaccine work? Not that it was gonna be dangerous, but would there be any point in having a vaccine if you're on, let's say, some of the treatments for rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis? Yes, it does seem to work, which is really important because they're people who have a suppressed immune system. People with cancer, they get sicker. So we really wanna protect that cohort um, of people. So yes, we would urge you to get, uh, get vaccinated, but if you have any concerns, speak to your oncologist. I was about to say, as someone who's had 
uh, cancer and does a lot of cancer advocacy, th there's always that important um, thing to say about every question in the end, isn't there, which is if you have any doubt, see your GP or see your specialist, uh, because they know your individual circumstances. Uh, I think we have time for one more question, Richard. Do you want to? Give sure, us sure. Um, are there any treatments, as opposed to vaccines, treatments on the horizon? Gee, that's interesting. Mary Louise, can I come to you? Yes, yeah, so look, normally we have updates, WHO, on treatments, and um, the, the latest one that we are expecting another update is an, an antiviral. And Ginny can speak to this as well, that for influenza, we have an antiviral, but you've got to know you've got influenza to take it within a set period of time for it to really work well. And so any antiviral for COVID-19 um, would work really well if we had take-home kits to know if we felt unwell or were concerned about exposure. We could test ourselves really quickly um, or go to the GP really quickly and they could test you having a point of care test so that you could get the antiviral very rapidly. But watch this space, um, more of that will come about. And of course, monoclonal antibodies, um, they're expensive. Um, uh, Trump had it, uh, he had polyclonal antibodies uh, and um, uh, who knows at what stage he was in his disease and whether it was effective for him, uh, but it looks uh, good, but it's not something that is necessarily cost effective for a lot of countries. Can I just ask Simon, are you still there, Simon Strum? Hi, I just want to come to you. We're very close to closing, but I, I, I remind people, if you've just joined us, that Simon is someone who has had COVID and is, in fact, still dealing with the impact from it. And, you know, I, as I speak as a girl who, who stopped science in year 10 and became someone who was more interested in English and the law, what's your final message to people watching this who've, who've listened intently and they're still thinking, yes, but will I get vaccinated or thinking, will I wait for a particular vaccine? A final word from you, sir. It certainly doesn't matter what vaccine you get as long as you get a vaccine. If you're going to um, think about getting a cold or something, you're totally wrong. You might end up with very mild symptoms, but you could die. So if you wanna take that risk, that's up to you. But I think it's very selfish if you don't get the vaccine because those in your family, those close to you, they can also suffer. One thing I didn't mention earlier was that Jason got his uh, COVID from his grandmother and her brother died of COVID and two of her relatives are still in ICU six weeks later. So, you know, please think of other people. And if you're looking after, you know, kids, you need to look after yourself to look after others as well. So whatever you do, get any vaccine, who cares what, as long as you don't get as sick as, you know, you would if you didn't take the vaccine. Well, thank you, Simon. Thank you for staying with us and, and giving us that, you know, moving and pertinent message. Thank you so much. And uh, I'll hand over to Richard Glass, if I may, as we move towards the end of our forum. Thanks, Julie. I just want to thank uh, everyone who's spoken tonight on the panel and our guest speakers. It's, it's been really compelling listening and I hope our audience um, has enjoyed it as much as I have. Um, also, I'd like to thank you, Julie, our indefatigable MC, for your support, much appreciated. Um, attendees, um, we will be sending out an email just to get some feedback from you. So please look out for that. And we'll also include a few links and URLs that might help you around some of the topics that we've discussed this evening. We also will be releasing a recording of this webinar and we'll advise you where you'll be able to see that as well. I also just like to mention, if I may, um, a little advertisement here. Um, Walper Jewish Hospital regularly holds um, wellbeing seminars um, with Julie uh, emceeing those as well. And we have one coming up that's pertinent to what we've been discussing about tonight, uh, discussing tonight. It's called Building Resilience in Our Teens During a Pandemic. There's a lot of practical strategies for parents and grandparents of adolescents and teens dealing with anxiety and uncertainty at the moment. So that's on the 1st of September at 7.30 p.m. And I'd also like to mention that if anyone who's um, listening to this webinar or knows someone that um, is concerned about a number of things that we're talking about and being affected by it, that we have some amazing organisations in our community that they should reach out to, such as, as Jewish Care, 
Jewish House, COA and others. So please don't hesitate to do so. And again, thank you for attending. And I would like to hand over now to Leslie Berger, who is the president of the New South Wales Jewish Board of Deputies. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Julie. Thank, thank you, Richard. I also wanted to thank all of our uh, panelists and guest speakers tonight. It's uh, most appreciated. It was a very informative evening. I also, Richard, need to thank you uh, and Alex Ripson in particular for organizing uh, tonight's webinar. I found it incredibly informative. You know, we covered so many issues, and I can't summarize them all, but some of the key takeouts for me were firstly, do we have the luxury of time? And the answer is clearly no. We, we can see what's happening in New South Wales. This disease is very serious. As Simon's uh, experience showed, it, it is a very serious illness and it is highly infectious. And what we didn't discuss today is the timeline from having one to two jabs and then actually getting full immunity because there is a lag. Once you have your first vaccine, then depending on the vaccine, it could be several weeks later to a couple of months before you have your second jab. And then it's only two to three weeks after your second jab, you achieve full immunity. So there is no time but the present to get a vaccine. Now we know, we know there is vaccine hesitancy, particularly when it comes to the question of whether or not you should have the AstraZeneca vaccine. And I think that Jason's analysis where you put the risk in context, when you compare it to other common risks is a great way of uh, analyzing it and understanding in real terms, just how low the risk is from having the AstraZeneca vaccine. Of course, you have to speak to your GP given your personal medical circumstances, but it's something with the Jewish community leadership, we are encouraging people to have any vaccine. The best vaccine is the one you can get today. And ultimately, and I found this very interesting, we all have a responsibility to get vaccinated, not just for our own health, but also for the health of our family, our loved ones and our community. Because realistically, it is only through very high levels of vaccination, we will continue to enjoy our civil liberties, that we'll be able to enjoy our religious life, that we'll be able to uh, start living life the way we used to and get back to work and live, go to a restaurant, all the things we took for granted. And for those who've got young children such as myself, you know, sending the kids to school, which is a huge, huge bonus. And finally, and I found this particularly interesting, is just how critically important it is to have the second jab. Uh, the first jab, and I found this an amazing message, the first jab is really for you. Um, the second jab is for you, but also for your community, because it's, the, it's only after the second jab that you significantly reduce the risk of transmission. I wanted to thank everyone again for your time, your patience, it's most appreciated. And on that note, please everyone get vaccinated, encourage your friends, your family to get vaccinated, it is our only pathway back to freedom. Thank you. I got vaccinated to protect myself, my family and my community. Some people say I've got the gift of the gab. My message is clear. Everybody go get the jab. My whole family did it so I can stop worrying. I got vaccinated because it's a smart thing to do. Out of lockdown, I want to interact with many people and I don't want to bring COVID home to my family. The risk of a blood clot from an AstraZeneca vaccine is much lower than the risk of a blood clot from taking the pill or going on a long haul flight. The thing is, it's important to get vaccinated as soon as possible with whichever vaccine you can get your hands on. As a young person with no pre-existing health conditions, I'm still suffering from COVID effects over 12 months later. The virus really can affect people of all ages. I'm getting vaccinated because I just want to hang out with my friends like normal again and I want to feel comfortable that I don't represent a risk to them and that they don't represent a risk to me. Social connection is so, so important and we know that the one way we can get back to normal and back to being with our mates is getting the vaccine. We know that either vaccine significantly reduces the risk of hospitalisation or death from COVID or the debilitating effects of long COVID. So I had my AstraZeneca jab to protect myself, 
my family and my community. It's safe, it's effective, and it's really important that we look after each other. So book in and get vaccinated. If you want to live to 101, vaccination is what you had to get done. Let's get vaccinated. Please get vaccinated. Go get the vax so we can get back to living life to the max.